we suffer in this world. We are in the process of being glorified even now that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. We have reached the pinnacle verse of all of Romans, which is really, really cool. The pinnacle verse, and you know the verse, probably if you've been in the church very long, you know this verse, it's Romans 8, 28. That's the pinnacle verse, and we're gonna finish up the chapter with that verse and going on. But we're gonna explain it to you now that you've read all of Romans up to this point, you're gonna finally see that passage presented to you in context. Not just like pulling it out of context and using it however you want to make yourself feel good. We're going to look at it right. So last week what we talked about, remember, is we talked about suffering. That we suffer in this world. Whether you're a believer, whether you're not a believer, doesn't matter. You're going to suffer. There is suffering. In the, some of it's just because we live in a sinful world and the world is fallen and we are fallen and other people are fallen. And so you're going to suffer, right? And what we learned is one of the ways we deal with that is that we understand as believers... We understand that there is a glory coming for us, that we are already on the way to glory. We are in the process of being glorified even now. And that the glory that we will receive far, far, far outweighs any suffering we could ever have on earth. Now, now that I tell you that, and now that you've heard that, you're like, yeah, but we still suffer. So get to something that helps me, right? Because some of you are like, that's not good enough, right? Because you're talking about tomorrow, right? We live in a I want it today kind of a kind of a scenario we want it today and so paul wants to explain to you why that's important why this is important because bad things are still happening so he says in verse 28 here's our verse for today look at this it says and we know that all things that in all things god works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose okay Let's break this down, all right? Let's break this down. First of all, notice it doesn't say that all things are good, okay? Not all things are good. There are things in your life that are just not good, right? There are things in non-believers' lives that are not good. We deal with not good all the time. The issue is not is there bad things, but what does God do with the bad things that happen in our lives, right? And notice it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Now, who gets to define good? Okay, who gets to define good, right? Because if you get to define good, you'll define good naturally differently than God will define good, right? If you, if you look at your life and God is doing good things, you might not think they're good because you have your own idea of, well, this is what I wanted. This was my desire and that was good. But God works out all things for good, the real good, okay? Your good is not necessarily good. You don't necessarily know what is good because you don't know the, the full span of the full process of you going from being foreknown by God to being glorified by God. You are in a process of going from being foreknown by God, that God knew you, to being glorified. You're in that process now. And what this is talking about is that this process of getting you to glory, to, to be glorified, to be like Christ, to be, have a resurrected body, this glorification process, it's going to happen, my friends. It's going to happen. And God is working together all the things that are happening in your life to achieve this good. You say, well, where did you get that? Where did you get that? I didn't read that in the Bible. Well, we're not done yet. We have a more of the chapter to read. So let's keep going. First of all, let's look at who it's talking about. This is talking about Christians. Because look what it says. It says, as we know all, that all things God works for the good of those who, so now he's going to define them, who love him. So does God work for the good of for the ultimate good for those who don't love him? It doesn't say that. It just says for those who love him. And it says for those who have been called according to his purposes. So there's two, there's two ifs. Like if this is the case. Now those two ifs, you're like, well, do I qualify for that? If you have put your faith in Christ, you are in there. If you will put your faith in Christ and you belong to him and you are born again, then you love God and you have been called according to his purposes. You don't have to worry about that. that you are in that boat. The people that are not are people that aren't believers. 
okay? People that haven't put their faith in Christ. And so, in other words, he's saying, I want you guys in Rome to be encouraged. Here's what I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that even when bad things happen to you in your life, like when bad things happen to you this week or bad things that happened last week, God is using it to bring what he ultimately wants. He's, he's using it to bring what he ultimately wants. Well, what's that? Well, what does God want? I've thought about this a lot. You ever just sit and think for a long time about God and you're like, well, what does God want from me? Like, what's God's ultimate deal? Like, what's he after? Right? Is he, is he just want to like beat up the devil? Is that his deal? Has he got, what's his deal? In Romans, his deal seems pretty clear. We got to this whole thing about sons, right? That he's called us to be his sons and to give us an inheritance. That he loves us. That we're born in the garden. Remember, we were born in the garden uh, Adam sinned and he's bringing it all back and he, he's bringing us from, from this place to glory. Here's, here's, what he, here's what I think his ultimate goal is. He wants to have a lot of sons that love him and daughters that love him. Now, don't get offended by the time I'm using the word son. The only reason I'm using the word son is not because it's not women. All of us as men and women, according to this, are sons. And the reason why is because the son in that culture got the inheritance, right? We want to make sure that we're the child that gets the inheritance, right? And so that's the only reason we're using that term. But sons and daughters of God, you are all going to get this inheritance. And God's doing this. He's trying to bring you there. And what he wants is a ton of, he wants a ton of kids. He wants to adopt a ton of kids. And he wants those kids to love him and to be like him. That's what he ultimately wants. And so the good that he's going after, that's what he's after. He's after you becoming one of those kids. So let's go on. This is where things get a little sticky. Watch this. He's going to go into the process here of what this looks like. It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. To be conformed to, his, to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. All right, here's what's going to happen. Some of you are going to freak out. You're going to go, what? Uh-oh. He said foreknew, and then he said predestined. So does Dustin think in, there's predestination? Of course I think there's predestination. The Bible teaches predestination. But that's not what this, this isn't talking about whether you go to heaven or hell. This isn't determining whether you go to heaven or hell or not. Read this in the context of what it's talking about. Who's it talking to? It's only talking to a small group of people. It's talking to Christians. Non-Christians aren't even in the equation here because they don't love God and they're not called according to his purposes. This is talking about a specific group of people. And when it says, the first thing it says is, it says he foreknew. What's it say? Let's look at this. It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Well, what does it mean that he foreknew them? Well, foreknew, some people have looked at that throughout time at different times in history and said foreknew meant that he could see what was going to happen. Well, it doesn't say foresee. It says, I foreknew you. He foreknew, take this personally, he foreknew you. Before the foundation of the earth, before there was ever a star in the sky, before he ever created the earth, God, in his brain and in his heart, knew you and everything about you. Everything you would do, everything you would think, every bad thing you would do, every good thing you would do, every evil thought. Every, he knew all of it. He, he had full knowledge of who you were. That's his point. He foreknew you because most of us, we say, oh, if God knew me, he wouldn't love me. If God really knew me, God couldn't love me if he knew me. But he foreknew you before the foundation of the earth and still decided that he wanted you to go through a process that has been predestined to go from being known to being glorified. And so he's going to lay out what the process is of, from being, I know you and I'm going to glorify you. He lays that process out. Look at this. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. What did he predestine? A process of things, some of them bad, that are going to happen to you that he's going to work out for your good. There are going to be things in my life that God is going to do. Well, why is it okay that these bad things are happening to me? Because they were a part of God's predestined plan to bring me from, from, from being a person that chooses him 
to a person who's glorified. There's a predestined plan. All the bad things that happened to you were predestined before the foundation of the earth for a good purpose to bring you to glory. That's the entire context of what this is. And it says here, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Right? It doesn't say he predestined you to, to make a decision to follow God. That, we'll get into that next week because that's, that's an issue that he's going to talk about. But this specifically, when it's talking about it, he's saying he predestined you to make you like Christ. This is the process of making you like Christ. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And why? He loved you, even though he foreknew you, even though he foreknew all the bad things. It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined, but he conformed to the image of his son. God planned this process out. And then it says in verse 30, and those he predestined, he also called. So now, all of a sudden, it shifts a little bit, but this is still a part of the process. Right? We start with God knew me, everything about me from the foundation of the earth. And then from there, I was predestined to be on this path to be more like Christ. But all of that's just in God's mind, isn't it? Everything that we've talked about so far isn't really reality for us because we're not really involved in it. It's just what God thinks. God knew us. That's what's in his brine. And God had a, a, a predetermined plan for what he's going to do, but he hasn't done anything. Now he calls. Those that he has this plan for, now he brings us into the fold and he says that he calls us. And we'll talk more about that call a little bit later when we get into chapter 9. But he calls us. He calls us into a relationship. And the reason why is because he has to be the one who calls us because naturally we won't just go to God, right? Unless God calls us, we're going to run away. We're like a dog, right? I let my dog out. She doesn't just come, right? She runs away and she goes and poops on the neighbor's yard and then she rolls around in the grass and she does stuff she's not supposed to do, right? Because she's a dog. She doesn't care about it. It's not until I call her then all of a sudden she's, oh, I can go over there. And then she still has a choice, right? And half the time she doesn't. She looks at me like I'm some kind of idiot. And she's like, I'm not going over there. What do you think? What are you going to do? And so I'm like, well, but he calls us. Again, we'll talk about that call a little bit more next week. But he calls us into this relationship as a son or a daughter, having full knowledge of who we are and the predestined plan for making us like Christ. That's what this is saying. And it says that those he called, it says those he called, he also justified. So, so what this is saying is that God gave us Christ's righteousness so that we would be okay for God to accept us. So what is he doing overall here? What is Paul doing? Paul is trying to explain to you, you believers in Rome, you believers in Atkinson, you believers here in, in our area, he wants you to understand that, yes, bad things will happen to you, but don't run away from God. Don't, you don't, you're not going to run away from God. You don't have to worry about that because, because God had predestined this. He knew this plan. He knew you before the face of the, before any of this was, he knows you better than you do. He foreknew this all. He has a predetermined plan. These things that are happening in your life, these bad things, these are a part of that plan for glorification. You need to think of those things in context. They're a part of this. And that God who had that plan, he called you. He called you. He, he, he made the first move. He's the one that called out for you. He wasn't out, out, out against you. He's not against you. He's for you. He called you. And once he called you, he justified you. He did everything necessary for you to have a relationship with him. He took away every barrier by dying on the cross so that it's okay for God to accept you because you're justified. And it says, those he justified, he also glorified. You hear that glorified? What's that mean? That, that, he's talking past tense. He's saying that your glory, your being glory, 
Yes, you're going to have an ultimate glory in the future, but the process has already started happening. He is already glorifying you. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. He is giving you, giving you, he is bringing you in this process. This whole process is what we call sanctification, bringing you from being foreknown to glorified and these bad things that happen along the way. Now, here's the great thing about this. Notice as he goes from being foreknown, he's going to say, I'm foreknown, right? And then I'm predestined, then I'm called, right? And then I'm justified, and then I'm glorified. Did you notice that there is no gap in there? And there is no one that escapes that process. God has a 100% success rate. That's what he's trying to com communicate to you. He doesn't say some of those who I foreknew, some of those that, it says those this, then this, and those, then this, and those, then this, and then this. It goes from, glory, from, from foreknowledge to, to glorification without any single person lost in the process. And here's why that's important. Here's why that's important if you're somebody like me didn't grow up in the church, who's lived life and looked at himself and said, man, why in the world would God ever love this guy? Who, who's made mistakes in his life and said, boy, why would God ever take me back? Right, maybe that's you. Here's the greatest fear for somebody like me is that I'm going to mess this thing up. I love that there's a process from going to foreknown. I believe he foreknew me, and I believe that he's bringing me to glory. But what could stop that from happening? Me? Some bad thing will happen in my life, and, and I'll get bitter, and I'll get angry, and I'll reject God, and I'll, and I'll run away, or I'll, I'll leave God. That's, that's the... What then shall we say in response to these things? That's a great question. In response to this process you just laid out, what do we say about this? Here's what he says. He who, if God is for us, who can be against us? All right, so now it's talking about people. If God is for me, if God is for me completing this process, if God is for bringing me into glory and being glorified, if God is doing that, if God started the process and never loses any, who can stand against me? This is an undefeatable process. I don't have to worry. And it's not just who can stand it. It's who. I'm a who. I don't live in Whoville, but I'm a who. I'm a who. It says, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things it's like listen man come on romans come on atkinson come on sunrise really are you nervous about this you're you're scared of this do you realize that the person the person who went through this whole process of choosing you and and grabbing you and saving you and dying on the cross He's not going to now all of a sudden say, ah, you know what, no. You know, I died on the cross. I suffered and took all of your sins upon me. But you know what? It's okay. I'll just let you go. Right? Because God's not a moron. God doesn't do that kind of stuff for no reason. Right? God had a predetermined plan from foreknowledge, from foreknown to glory. And you can't stop that process. So Paul says you don't have to be afraid of that. And here's why. Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And so God loves us. But how do we love God back? Right? Our love for God comes from experiencing how much God loved us. That in the fact that he foreknew us, he knew who we were. From the foundation of the earth, everything about you. He knows every thought, every, he knows all of it. And he still, before the foundation of the earth, knowing everything that you would do and knowing the cost that it would, cost, that it would take because his justification is in the process, he knew and he created a plan to get you to glory. He's not having to pivot and saying, oh man, 
Dustin messed up. Now I got to redo the whole plan. Dustin ruined my whole plan. This was the plan from the beginning. And so how do we love him? Well, one is that we do it by not being afraid because you know that God loves you and he won't spare anything. There is nothing he will spare to get you from knowledge for knowledge to glory. He will spare nothing, not even his own son. I'll be honest, if it was up to me, if it was up to me with any of y'all, I love you. But I love you to an extent. I'm not giving up my son. I'll go through a lot of things to get you from here to glory, but I will not give up my son. No way. That's where I draw the line. God has no line. He has no line. And the second thing, let's look at verse 33. Who will bring any charges against those who God has chosen? All right. Who? Because there's people bringing all kinds of accusations against you. Well, you're a bigot and, and you're, you're, you're homophobic and you're all these. And, you know, you deserve to go to hell for all the nasty things you believe. That's all. Who, who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised from the dead, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. What's he saying? There's only one judge of you as a person. Only one person will ever judge you or has the right to judge you as a human being, and that's your creator. You will at some day be judged by Jesus Christ. He's saying, dude, you know the judge. <laughs> and the judge died on the cross to call you innocent. I think you're good. I really think you're good. I think, I think you can trust that the judge who actually gave up his only son is going to be good with you. Trust the judge. Trust him. Trust him because because he died on the cross. Trust him because he prepared this process from foreknowledge all the way to glorification. Trust that this, these bad things that are happening are a part of his plan and it's for your good. All things are working together for those, for your good. This is all for your good. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or partnership Or persecution, right? These are bad things, right? He, he's trying to lay out, these are like as bad as it gets. Or famine or nakedness. Now that's really bad. Or danger or sword, right? Some stab in action. As it is written, for we... For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But he, what he's trying to do with that is he's saying it doesn't get any worse than that. That God doesn't leave, that this is a part of his plan, even if you're like a sheep that goes to the slaughter. That's still a part of this foreknown to glory. It's still a part of it. Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him. You're not more than conquerors on your own, but through him, through this process, and through the things that are happening, even, in, even when you are being brought to the slaughter, you are conquering because you are conquering and getting from here to glory. It's all a part of the great plan of God, working all things for the good of those who love him. And why is that? It says, no, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why? Because we don't drive those bad things that are happening because we are in Christ, they don't drive us away from God. They drive us toward God. So here's one of the real problems that we see in people. You'll see people that have kind of given their life to God. They kind of believe God, but they've never really trusted God. Okay? And so then something bad happens in their life, and they say, well, God's not for me. God's against me, and they run away from God. That's not how believers run things believers trust god believers go through this and they say well wait a second what is god doing in my life i know god 
And I have nowhere else to go but to go to Jesus. What am I going to do? Go to the world? I have nowhere else to go but to go to Jesus. And so these bad things that happen in the life of a believer, they don't run us away from God. They run us toward God. They drive us to God. These bad things are a part of the process of foreknowledge to glorification, and we recognize it. God, I don't know what you're doing. I hate this. This is bad. What's happening is bad. It's bad, 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 bad. I don't want to deal with this. But I have nowhere else to go. You're my God, and you're allowing this, and you have a good reason for it. And I don't know what it is, but you have a good reason. I do, I do know what the final conclusion will be. I know that this is leading to my glorification because it started in a process that's been predestined from foreknowledge all the way to my glorification. I know that. For I am convinced, verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, that pretty much covers it, neither angels nor demons. So uh, things on heaven, right? We're talking about life and death. We're thinking, talking about neither demons or angels. So now we're talking about even things in heaven. Heavenly things can't stop this process from happening. Neither the present nor the future. Well, that's good because I was thinking that in the future maybe something that could happen to stop this, right? I'm good so far, but the future... No, nothing even in the future can stop this. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, nothing anywhere on earth or in heaven. And so this is how we close this. This is how we'll close this. When bad things happen, some people turn away from God because they think, man, I must not be God's kid. Maybe God doesn't love me. Something's wrong. Or I don't love God. I, I don't love him now. But that's not going to be us. That's not how the son or the daughter of God thinks. When these bad things come our way, allow them to drive you to God. Say, God, you're the only one. This is a part of your plan, and so I want, I want this to be efficacious. I want this to be right. God, whatever it is, I know this is bad. It hurts. I hate this. But God, I know this is a part of the process, that you preordained this. This was a part of the plan all along to make me the person you want me to be, one of your sons or one of your daughters that loves you and is glorified and shares glory with you. God, I thank you for this word. You led this whole thing up to this. The whole passage leads up to this. The whole book of Romans is leading up to how do we deal with the really bad things that happen. God, and if we're honest, we look in our life and we see bad thing after bad thing. Some of us more bad things than good things. Some of us, we became a believer and the bad things increased. The pain increased. Relationships were broken. People started to hate us. But God, you have a process. And God, we trust you that you will not let anything stop this process because you are are good. You've preordained it. It's it's a part of your plan for all of us who who have put our faith in you. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.